Hi everyone. Look at uh, our next packet, Atomic Theory Part 1. Now, just in terms of where you should be when you look at this, um, as I speak, it's, we're just about to start the second week, so it's Sunday afternoon, you know, right before the second week starts. And to be honest, you guys have um, a quiz coming up this week, okay, the first quiz, which I'll assign later in the week. And this material is not going to be on that quiz, okay? So we're kind of a little bit ahead with the packets, and that's kind of my intention. I always want to give you more material than you need. So if you want to go ahead a little bit, you can. But you should be finished with uh, the last packet, you know, uh, conversion factors, you know. Once you finish that conversion factor packet, everything up to that point uh, can and will be on that first quiz, okay? So. That's where we're going to go, okay? Now, let's look at the uh, packet. So again, just complete this packet after you're completely happy with, um, you know, practicing conversions. All right. Now, we're going to start talking about the real chemistry, so to speak, the real deal, right? And uh, real chemistry starts way back in the day in like 1803 with really the uh, kind of revisiting the Greeks' ancient idea of the atom, okay? Now, remember, back in the day, we talked about it already back in uh, you know 460 BC, right? Democritus did that thought experiment where he could basically cut things in half in his head and got to the point where he couldn't cut it in half anymore, uncut up all the atom, right? And basically, Dalton, who was I think a Welsh school teacher back in the day, revisited this idea of the uncuttable, and you know this is where the word atom comes from now. Okay, so Dalton came up with a bunch of postulates, right? We now call these hypoth. ECs, right? A hypothesis is just an idea, and people always get the word hypothesis and theory confused, okay? In science, they have very different and distinct meaning, okay? So, a postulate is just a hypothesis, it's an idea, okay? I have an idea that inside every Coke machine there's a little man who throws a little can of Coke through the hole when you put money in. That's my idea, that's my hypothesis, okay? And if I were to employ the scientific method, I would test my hypothesis. So I design an experiment to test the hypothesis. Is there really a little man in there? You could bang on there and say, hey, is there a little man in there? <laughs> and he may or may not answer. You know, you can design your own experiment, right? You can maybe uh, knock the thing over and listen for an ouch. <laughs> <laughs> right, this is just a silly example, right? You come up with a hypothesis in science, you then test your hypothesis. If your idea is right, and you do experiments, you can predict what's going to happen in the experiments. So, for example, Newton, you know, Newton came up with this hypothesis of gravity. Yeah, he came up with some math to describe it, and then he tested the math. He just kept dropping objects, apples not included, right? And it turns out that Newton's laws are provable, right? So they work every time. They then become a proven scientific theory. So a scientific theory is something that's true and real, okay? And you can predict behavior. And you know, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but if you're kind of ever in one of those conversations with a born-again Christian, no offense if you're one of those, oh, evolution's just a theory. And they're right, evolution is just a theory, much in the same way as gravity is just a theory. It's a proven set of scientific facts, okay? What they're doing is confusing hypothesis and uh, theory, okay? So Dalton's uh, postulates, hypotheses back in the day could not be proved. As we'll see later in the packet, we couldn't prove the existence of atoms until later when kind of technology caught up. We were able to see them later in the 1980s, for example, with an STM. But before that time, you know, the classic experiments in, in the field, you know, the golden age of uh, chemistry was really around 1900, which wasn't until, you know, 100 years later, okay, when these things were proven, okay. So Dalton comes up with these ideas, okay, which we now just assume are correct. And we'll look at him, okay? So he said, and this is revolutionary stuff back in the day, right? Well, the first one is not really revolutionary, it's just stealing the Greeks' idea. So matter is composed of extremely small particles called atoms, fair enough, right? So each piece of matter is, you know, can be divided down into things called atoms, the smallest stable piece, yeah? Now, this is where it gets a little different, right? So Dalton says, all atoms of an element and we define what element was earlier. All atoms of an element are identical, right? So yeah, atoms of the same type stuck together make an element, yeah? So each atom, each atom type, each element has unique chemical and physical properties because they're all the same kind of atom, okay? So atoms are themselves unique, but atoms of an element are identical, 
All right, if that makes sense. All right, so next one. This is kind of an interesting one if you're a big fan of the, uh, <laughs> you know, the kind of the Dungeons and Dragons universe and things like that. In, in the Dungeons and Dragons universe, this thing called alchemy, where you know you cast a spell and lead turns into gold, right? Okay, that's just not possible. You can't turn one kind of atom into another. You can't turn a lead bar into a gold bar because uh, there are X number of gold atoms in the universe. There are X number of lead atoms in the universe and you can't convert between them. Think of a big box of Legos, right? With all 119 types of atoms in that box, just in different amounts, okay? That's what the universe is. It's just a box of atoms of different types stuck together in interesting ways, okay? That's why 99% of the universe is actually hydrogen because during the Big Bang, Hydrogen is just basically, and we'll see later in the packet, four subatomic particles stuck together. It's the simplest piece of matter. Then later on, those hydrogens fused in stars to make heavier elements, which we're made from. Okay, so there's you know, there's a box full of Legos, there's a box full of atoms. We call it the universe. Different numbers of atoms, and there are 119 varieties in the box. Okay, you stick them together to make elements and compounds. All right, now Dalton went on to kind of define what a compound was. And as we know, this is true. So, you know, in hindsight, this is very obvious, but at the time, not so much. Compounds are formed when atoms of more than one type are combined in the same ratio, right? So it says same relative amount. So two H's and an O makes water. All right, make some, you know, extra notes here if you wish. All right, so that's Dalton's postulates back in 1803, okay, which we, call as the, which we now call the atomic theory, right? If you're a player of video games, and I know I was back in the day and still dabble from time to time, one of my favorite video games is Civilization, right? And in Civilization, the first uh, civilization to discover atomic theory is the first to discover steam and the steam engine, which gives you a big advantage in that game. And the behavior of gases, steam is a gas, is really governed by the atomic theory. If you think of steam particles as just little round spheres that bounce around, gas theory comes out of that, okay? So that was the kind of the fundamental kind of leap forward in technology. That's why Britain, you know, led the uh, Industrial Revolution because they were the first to develop steam power. Steam power was a direct consequence of the atomic theory, which is kind of interesting, and that plays out in that game kind of nicely. All right, so back to it. So um, we've already looked at the components of matter a little bit, okay, when we looked at kind of, you know, elements and compounds, mixtures, different kinds, okay. So we know a little bit about how matter is defined, right, but what we're going to do, we're kind of, we're going to kind of uh, put all the words together. So that is not a complete list of matter, okay. So let's just read it. So in the introductory le lectures, we took a brief look at different types of matter, elements, compounds, and mixtures, right? Okay, but we can kind of make them smaller still. So what I want you guys to do, and take a little break here, pause, and in this spot here, I want you to write words that describe matter, smaller and smaller and smaller. I'll give you a few words we've got already, okay? We've already got atom, okay? We've already got element, and we've already got compound. Okay, and this is for pure matter, so no mixtures right now. So think of pure matter and different jargony words we use in science to explain what's in there, essentially, okay? So different words that explain the components of pure matter, okay? So give it a, give it a shot. Now remember, some of these things we haven't met yet. So there are subatomic particles, which are small pieces of matter. So think about smaller and smaller and smaller. Basically, to put them in a flow chart to show you how matter is actually made from the ground up, okay? So try and think big to small, as many words as possible, you know, that describe pure matter. Okay, pause there, come on back when you got a list. Okay, got your list, all right. So if I start from the top down, elements and compounds, okay, take a gold bar, cut it into pieces, I get down to the size of atoms, okay? But if I take an ice cube and cut it down into indivisible particles, I get molecules, okay? So H, H, O stuck together. Take the molecule, cut it into smaller bits, I get the individual atoms, fair enough, okay? Now what I'll also write here is ions. We haven't met this yet, we'll meet it in a later packet. Maybe you know of ions, maybe you don't. Ions are just atoms or molecules with a charge, okay? So Na plus is the sodium ion. It's an atom with a charge, right? Okay, so elements and compounds, nice cube, a gold bar, right? 
They're made from individual atoms or individual molecules, depends what it is. Or if it's an ionic compound, table salt, Na plus and Cl minus ions. Okay. I get smaller still. Now this is the realm of the subatomic, right? Smaller than an atom. Well, what's in an atom? We've got electrons. We've got a nucleus. We've got things in the nucleus. Protons. Toms. Neutrons. Okay, so these are words you probably know, yeah? So we've split open our atom now. These are unstable things. This is the realm of subatomic unstable particles. Electrons, neutrons, protons. Electrons, nucleus, protons and neutrons are things that are smaller than an individual atom. They're the components of an atom, okay? If I go smaller still, and uh, you can take your nucleus inside of protons and neutrons. If I take a proton and split it up, there are actually quarks in there. Okay, and there's a bunch of other subatomic particles we maybe know of. Photon, for example. Okay, quark, maybe you heard of. Okay, but there's like 17 fundamental particles in nature. All right, and they're all down here. We call it the particle zoo. We'll talk more about it as we go. We're familiar with some of them. Some of them are more exotic, like maybe you heard of neutrino or something like that, or positron, things like that, right? Okay, so those weird kind of Star Trek-y type words are real words, okay? And they're down there in the particles, uh, but we don't usually see those in chemistry because we're typically interested in, mat in matter that's stable, okay? And if you look at my list here, they've been put in a certain order. So as I go that way, they get smaller. And that's the line in the sand between stable and unstable, okay? So chemistry is a study of stable matter, atoms or above. Particle physics, these interesting things down here, pretty much. Okay, now how do we relate those? That's not a really a good uh, relationship map. So let's do a map, right? So let's, now I've got left spending of space here, right? So if I have pure matter, anything with a formula, okay, I'm gonna put it here. And I'm gonna emulate or just copy over our last little map, okay? So I'm gonna have elements and compounds. Fair enough, right? So far, not any different than before. Well, let's continue with that, okay? So before we had giant elements and molecular elements. Similarly, giant and molecular compounds. So for example, giant element might be gold or a diamond. Molecular element might be nitrogen, N2, O2 maybe. Okay. Giant compound, NaCl, table salt. Molecular compound, H2O, for example. Okay, so that's based on size. Giant is big, molecular is small. Okay, so that's where we were before, but now we have a chance to kind of use this kind of idea of things getting smaller and smaller and then make these things smaller, right? So, I love the idea of the periodic table. Now, here's the periodic table. All right, now I advise you to kind of print this from the website, keep a copy for yourself, okay? I love to think of the periodic table a bit like nature's subway. <laughs> That's a little analogy, right? So you go in the subway and you're, you're presented with all these options to put on your sandwich. You look down and behind the glass, there's maybe 20 little of those metal containers with tomatoes and olives and lettuce and onions. Chardonnay, my favorite, right? Okay, and you can have the person go into one of those little buckets and put that on your sandwich, okay? So I like to think about all the boxes in the periodic table a bit like the boxes at Subway. So let's pretend we're making gold bars, right? So you walk into nature's Subway as an employee and the boss says, today we're making a gold bar. And you think to yourself, well, what's a gold bar? Oh, it's a thousand billion billion atoms of gold stuck together. So what do you do? You go in, you find the gold bucket, you take a gold out, stick it to another gold, stick to another gold, and you keep sticking the gold atoms together until you've got a thousand billion billion, and that's your gold bar, okay? Long, tedious work making a, an element, right? Okay, so fundamentally, if we go back here, if I have something like gold, right, that's an example, what's it fundamentally, fundamentally made from? Atoms of the same type, okay? So a giant element is made from atoms of the same type, one gold next to another gold next to another gold and it grows up thousand billion billion of them something you can see in your hand a gold bar fair enough right 
Well, what about a molecular element? Well, let's say it's oxygen day at work. Walk into nature's subway. What's the formula of oxygen? Maybe we'll put it here. O2, right? So, oxygen, there it is. You just reach into the oxygen bucket, pull out an oxygen atom, reach in again, stick them together, two oxygen stuck together, oxygen molecule, boom, done. That's a short day at work. <laughs> a lot shorter than making gold bars, right? Because it's just two atoms stuck together. So again, doesn't matter if it's just two or a thousand billion billion, atoms of the same type stuck together are elements. Molecular is small, giant is big. Fair enough. Now, we can do a similar thing over here with compounds, right? Now, I want to show you, I'm going to do this for a reason. I want to make a little bit of space, right? So this is really the same thing. I just want to be able to move across here, right? So what's a molecule made from? Well, our favorite molecule is H2O, right? So imagine working at Nature's Subway again, right? Well, what are we doing today, boss? Well, we're making water. H2O is the formula or the recipe, right? So take an H, take an H, take an O, stick them together. What do I make? water, right? So fundamentally, molecules are made from atoms in the right ratio, all right? So a molecule of water is made from two H's and an O. Fair enough, okay? Now, why did I do this? I wanted a little bit of space, right? Because I need the space to show you how to make a giant compound, right? The classic giant compound is NaCl. And as we mentioned, NaCl and essentially all giant compounds are not made from atoms, they're made from ions, right? An ion, as we mentioned, is either an atom or a molecule with a charge, right? So it's not Na, it's Na plus. It's not Cl, it's Cl minus. An atom with a charge and an atom with a charge, but opposite, so they stick, right? Na plus, Cl minus. So ions, if they're atomic ions like Na plus and Cl minus, are made from atoms, all right? So we get an Na atom and a Cl atom, charge them up, plus and minus, they stick together. However, there is something called sodium nitrate, NO3 minus. And NO3 minus, as we'll see later packets, that's a molecular ion. So you can give any small piece of matter a charge, atom or molecule, right? And when they have opposite charges, they stick. So ions can be made from either molecules or atoms. Interesting, okay? And molecules, of course, are made from atoms. So where do all roads lead? All roads lead to atoms. That's why the atom was such a fundamental discovery, okay? Because it's the smallest stable bit of matter. As you can see, everything goes to it, so everything comes from it. Everything is made from atoms as the smallest stable piece of matter. So above an atom is stable. That's the realm of chemistry, right? But we acknowledge our physics friends, right? There are things that are smaller than atoms, which were discovered by chemists, <laughs> right? So the realm of particle physics, unstable, and this is now the realm of particle physics, right? But what's inside an atom? Well, we have our list up here, right? When we think of our classic picture, our like 1950s picture, we have this little seed in the center with all these things whizzing around it, right? What is that? Well, the little things whizzing around, you're shouting at the screen, the word you're shouting is electron or electrons, right? Electrons are the fundamental negative charge carriers. They're one of 17 indivisible particles in nature, right? Okay, particles do stuff, right? And they, if you like, it's an old model, we'll dispel it later. They orbit the nucleus. So that little pip at the center of an atom is the nucleus. The electrons, if you like, are orbiting it. Okay, fair enough. Now electrons are minus, but matter, you pick it up, it doesn't give you a big electrical discharge, right, normally, yeah. So that means for every plus there's a minus, matter is electrically neutral. So what's the plus thing in there? Well, inside the nucleus we have protons, which are plus. Okay, and then if I just had protons in the nucleus, it wouldn't weigh as much. So other things are in there that are dead weight. They weigh kind of the same as protons, but they have no weight. They are called neutrons. Sorry, they weigh as much as protons, but they have no charge. That's what I'm trying to say. Neutral, no charge, neutron, right? There we go. Now, inside a proton, I got three quarks. Quarks are indivisible 
fundamental particles. You can't break a quark down into smaller things. In a neutron, there are three quarks. There are six quarks altogether. They can be combined in different ways to make different things. Okay, three quarks make a proton, three different quarks make a neutron. Okay, extra credit, and I'll make this due by Friday. What's the date on Friday? So, something today, 8, 9, 10, 11, I think it's 12th or something, right? <laughs> Friday the 12th. Tell me, for extra credit, email, usual thing, what three quarks make up a proton? What three quarks make up a proton? Okay. Now, <clears throat> again, there are smaller things as well, the so-called particle zoo, okay, so there are 17 fundamental indivisible particles in nature, it's called the standard model, okay. Maybe I'll put it on this, you know, if I can find a nice picture online, I'll put it right in the video for you, okay. All right, now, maybe asking yourself a question, quarks, right, kind of a big deal, I think it was a Nobel Prize awarded for the discovery of the quark, and the question is, well, where were they found? I found one under my bed. No, <laughs> you actually have to do an interesting experiment to get them, okay? So, it turns out up until a few years ago, Fermilab, which is uh, kind of Batavia, West Chicago area, okay? That's the, an atom smasher, right? It's not really an atom smasher. We'll talk about details in a second, okay? But Fermilab was where quarks were discovered in the 1960s. Now, if you look at Fermilab, if you look at it from, this is kind of a bad picture, right, okay, if you look at it on Google Earth, try it, right, just go up 59, keep going until you see two kind of big rings in the prairie, right, and there's a building here, Fermilab, all right, it's right in West Chicago, Batavia, right, okay, so these rings in the prairie, there they are, what are they? Well, people think, oh, that's the particle accelerator, right, well, no, it's not, it's actually two canals, two kind of water courses, right, and why are the two kind of circular rings of water in the prairie, one big and one small? It's to cool what's underneath. So if you look, un if you look at this ring here, you look underneath, there's a tunnel. And you can see there's a slight curve to that tunnel. That's probably about three miles across there. Okay, so the tunnel has a diameter of three miles, slight curvature to it. And here, if you're a fan of electric car racing, you played scale, scale electrics, you know how the cars go around the track with electricity. This is like a scale electric track for protons, okay? So because protons are charged, they can be made to run in a circle by an electric field, right? So by a magnetic field, right? So that's kind of a, a magnetic field in there, all right? And what you do, you throw your protons in and they go around Fermilab in that direction, okay? So the protons, and you can ramp up the voltage and they can go close to the speed of light. So you have these protons moving at close to the speed of light. Fair enough, right? Now, well, let me just keep talking here, get distracted. Well, fair enough, so you have these protons moving in the circle close to the speed of light, so what? Okay, well, what you do over here, this is called the antiproton source, right? Turns out there is such a thing as antimatter. It's not just a science fiction thing, it's a real thing. So for every particle we know, there's an antiparticle that exists, okay? And people think, oh, it's what, negative matter? No, it's not negative matter. It has the same mass, it just has the opposite charge. So for proton, there's antiproton. Electron, positron, positive electron, okay? So we can make negatively charged protons over here, antiprotons, and this is what Bill Foster, our current congressman, actually used to do. Bill Foster is a physicist by uh, training, and before going into the politics, he worked at Fermilab. He's like one of two scientists in Congress. That explains a lot. Okay, <laughs> all right. Now, because they have the same mass but opposite charge, they fly around the ring, the particle accelerator, in the opposite direction. Okay, so now do this thought experiment in your head. Pretend this is a NASCAR race, right? All the even-numbered cars are going this way, and all the odd-numbered cars are going this way, protons and antiprotons, at 200 miles an hour. What's eventually going to happen? They're going to smash into each other, right? So when the protons and the antiprotons collide, in a head-on collision, there's a lot of energy in there, and it's like throwing an egg against the wall, right? When you throw the quark against the wall, it smashes open and other things come out, okay? So, 
you can create other subatomic particles by colliding protons. I just said quarks, didn't I? So when you, can, when you hit a proton into an antiproton, three quarks come out. That's what's inside, right? But if you hit them even harder and harder and harder, which is now happening in CERN in Switzerland, even more energetic particles come out, right? Okay, so initially quarks were discovered at Fermilab, okay? Now, <clears throat> Why? <laughs> Fermilab is a multi-billion dollar facility, right? What's its purpose? Is it to get a better weapon? Is it to solve cancer? No, this is kind of the fundamental difference between chemists and physicists, all right? Aside from chemists tend to get married. That's a joke. <laughs> all right, so the bottom line is chemists are interested in practical problem solving. We're interested in making a new plastic for a camera case or something, right? We're interested in making a new kind of magnetic material for a hard drive. We make new stuff, right? We make a new drug, for example, right? Okay, whereas physicists don't make things, right? They try and answer the super big question, right? What is the super big question of humans? Why are we here, right? And so in the past, that's been the realm of religion, right? So while we're here because, you know, <laughs> and they talk about deities, right? But the physics community say, well, you know, if God created the universe, fair enough, that's your point of view, but why don't I just go and do an experiment to prove how the universe was created? And that's what's happening right now, okay? So back to the NASCAR race. When you have these particles running in opposite directions, yeah, they smash and everything comes out. Now let's pretend that was a NASCAR race. You could go back as a kind of a crash investigator and you could theoretically stick everything back together to make the car, right? So it's a bit like saying, oh, how do you know how your toaster works? Well, you take it apart and put it back together again, right? How do you know how the universe works? The universe is just made of matter. Well, you take it apart and put it back together again. So if we understand what the universe is made from, we can understand how it all works, okay? So this is the realm of particle physics, you know, Stephen Hawking, all that kind of stuff, okay? And it does bring in the question, you know, if God created the universe and then the physicists come up with a theory that proves how it was made by some other means, that's interesting. It's true, the Pope actually told Stephen Hawking not to study the origins of the universe. Interesting, why would he do that? Why would he do that? Okay, so unfortunately the, uh, the particle accelerator at Fermi wasn't quite powerful enough to get all the particles, yeah? It turns out you need a bigger racetrack to get to the energies needed to really crack it open and discover what's called the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was discovered just a few years ago. It was big news and it was figured out in Switzerland, right? So in Switzerland, we have a bigger ring. It's called the CERN Super Collider. It's probably eight miles across there, not three. Okay, and this ring is so big, it actually just goes into France a little bit. Okay, so it's right on the border with France and the tunnel actually goes into France a little bit. When the protons go past, they flash their passports. That's a joke, right? Okay, with the bigger ring, they can go faster, more energy. And literally after six months of being in operation, they discovered the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson had been envisioned by Peter Higgs in the 1960s. He predicted at what energy you'd find it, and he predicted its properties. It's responsible for giving things mass, okay? Because of the Higgs boson, literally everything exists, and they call it the God particle, all right? So Peter Higgs found it, well, theoretically found it in the 60s, confirmed just a few years ago, okay? And, you know, I flashed up picture up again of the standard model. That's the last one to be found. We now have a complete list of all subatomic particles. We know what the universe is made from, okay? So you combine three quarks, you make a proton. A proton is a hydrogen nucleus, right? You combine that with an electron, nope, time's running out, and you make hydrogen. So why is hydrogen the most abundant thing in the universe? Because it's the simplest. It's made from four subatomic particles, right? And then you can start combining hydrogens together to make other things. That was my alarm. Okay, obviously, uh, time to pause before my thing you know, shuts off by itself. I'll be back in just a minute, okay? Okay, so we're back. Now, went off a bit, <laughs> went off on a bit of a rant there, okay, about Fermilab. Um, but bottom line is, we now have a complete kind of list of all the particles in nature, right? Okay, and what's called the standard model. So the universe is made from those components, okay? And we can kind of use the standard model. We can uh, work our kind of spreadsheet backwards, okay? 
we can use this now and work it backwards, okay? So for example, water. So if I have a drop of water, and I'm gonna go kind of from the top down. So kind of have this on the side, right? So we're here, right? And we've just gone to here, yeah? So I've got a drop of water, right? What's it made from? Well, it's made from these things, individual molecules, right? So if we look at molecules under the STM machine, they look like these little jelly beans, right? Okay, so that's my molecule. So a macroscopic object is made of individual particles we call molecules if it's a, a drop of water. There they are, right? It's in that picture before. And then if I kind of disassemble that, I will find inside an oxygen stuck to a hydrogen, stuck to a hydrogen. I call these the passengers inside the molecule. They're in there forever, right? Okay, and there they are. If I take my molecule, see where we are on the list here, we're there, right? So pure matter, water drop, it's a compound made of molecules. Well, I can now cut it into its atoms, yeah? So I can take my water molecule, cut it into atoms. I get an oxygen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen. Maybe I'll draw them like that, okay? So those are my three atoms, yeah? Like working at Nature Subway, H plus H plus O, stick them together, boom, right? Okay, but then I can take my atoms themselves and I can see what's inside those. Hydrogen, as we mentioned, is the simplest possible atom. It's just a proton with an orbiting electron. That's it. It's a proton with an orbiting electron. That's it. All right. Oxygen, now real quick, we're going to do this later. Okay, if I go back to my uh, favorite periodic table. Okay, the number of protons an atom has is simply the atomic number, and they're ordered in an increasing number, right? So hydrogen number one, one proton, helium two. Look at oxygen; it's got eight, eight protons, right? So you've got eight protons in there, and also it turns out that when you start sticking more than one proton in the nucleus, you need things in the way to stop them repelling, right? Those things are called neutrons. It's also got eight neutrons for an average oxygen. That's its nucleus. Eight protons, eight pluses, I need eight minuses. And then we'll do this again, details later. Eight electrons, two on the inside, six more, makes eight. Okay, again, details on this little map here later, but I wanted to show you what we're gonna see later on. All right, fair enough, All right? Back to our map. We're here, right? We just talked about nucleus, protons, neutrons are in there. Again, we can take that proton, and if we want, we can split it up into three quarks. Okay, and quarks are fundamental. One of 17 parts, six, six quarks, six of 17 fundamental particles. All right. So, you know, we can dissect matter from the top down now, and then we can reassemble it to make a glass of water. All right. So, back in the day, Dalton's theory was controversial, right? Okay. So, today we just take it for granted, right? but back in the day it was new thinking, right? So, we take atomic theory and its eventual kind of consequences for granted, but back in the day that was kind of crazy stuff, right? So, the discovery that, of Dalton's truth, if you like, proving that all these things exist, right? Atoms exist, and then we find out what's inside an atom. That was the exciting time in, in science, right? So, around 1900, Right, late 1800s, next 30 years, up to about 1930, 1940, something like that. Well, maybe 1935. Golden age. Golden age of the physical sciences. This is when the nucleus was discovered, the electron was discovered, everything about an atom, its kind of fundamental nature was discovered. Very exciting, all right? So what I want you to do, I'm not gonna do this for credit right now, hint, hint, right now, it could be on a test in the future, okay? Make notes by yourself about these things, okay? The first one is the discovery of the electron. Now, the, the electron was discovered by J.J. Thompson in Cambridge, okay? We'll talk more about that in a moment, all right? So, the electron was discovered first. I think it was late 1800s, okay? All right, and then my most favorite experiment of all time is Rutherford's gold foil experiment, okay? The gold foil experiment proves the existence of the nucleus, okay? Because before, if you think about it, you pick up a piece of matter, it doesn't give you a big electric shock, right? Thompson, pro pro <laughs> Thompson proved 
there are negative things in there, negative things he called electrons, yeah. So that means there must be plus things in there as well, because it's neutral, kind of when combined. And he came up with what's called the plum pudding model. Now, plum pudding is like a fruitcake, right? Okay, so you have a little bit of raisin, a little bit of walnut, whatever, right? So you have these little particles in this batter, right? So think of plus and minus particles as walnuts and raisins, right? So there they are, right, spread through the batter. And that's how J.J. Thompson, a discoverer of the electron, believed matter to be composed, right? And then Rutherford comes along and does probably the most elegant experiment ever, right? And proves that, hey, an atom is mostly empty space, and that's the empty space where the electrons is. You know, 0.001% of the size of an atom is actually the nucleus where most of the matter is, okay? so. Cool. That's where the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Okay, and this is called this is called the nuclear model versus the so-called plum pudding model. It got a bit east coast west coast for a while, right? So Thompson was in Cambridge and Rutherford was in Manchester. Manchester University at the time was probably the one of the top schools in, in the UK if it if not the top. Okay, nowadays Oxford and Cambridge, but hey, back in the day University of Manchester was where it was all going on. Okay. And they had this big battle backwards and forwards and eventually Weatherford did the gold foil experiment and the, it was done. All right, so let's talk a little bit. So we're going to get into atoms and isotopes, right? So I'm just put, move this, that's better. All right, so atoms, as we know, are the smallest stable pieces of matter. Okay, typically on the order of 0.1 to 0.6 nanometers, 0.18 is kind of a bit larger than it should be, okay. And uh, so that's, typ that's a typical range though, 0.1 to 0.6 nanometers, okay. And you know, you can see atoms or you can image them with STM, right? So here's an STM image of a silicon chip, okay. As you can see, it's a giant arrangement of silicon atoms. Each sphere is a silicon atom. As you can see, they're in a kind of concentric hexagon arrangement. That's a regular repeating pattern. It's a giant element. Okay, so if you look down here, because you're scanning that tip across the surface, literally I can do this, right? I can scan my tip across the surface and see when it goes up and goes down. So it rises up, rises up. And because you know where the tip is, you can put a scale on it. Okay, so you can look at that scale there. And if I look, I'm kind of looking at the bottom of the hexagon. So from here to about here is 1.3 nanometers. And what you've done, because you've put a scale on that, how many atoms is that? 2.5, right? 2.5 atoms equals 1.3 nanometers. Awesome, right? Awesome. Now, if you think about it, can you figure out the width of an atom now if you've got that conversion factor? Yeah, just convert atoms to nanometers. Times, pause, right? Put this in as a fraction, atoms on the bottom. Figure out how big a single silicon atom is. All right, you back. 2.5 atoms is 1.3 nanometers. Boom, what do I get? Make sure I get the answer right. 0.52. Nanometers. It's in the range, right? It's a little on the big side, but hey, that's how big a single silicon is. Fantastic. Now, a little bit of extra credit here, okay? Now, we talked about magnification of an STM before, right? So you can see single atoms, yeah? And when you think about magnification, so when you look at a microscope or something, it might say times 60 magnification, right? What does that actually mean? It's actually a ratio. So what's in the eyepiece is 60 times bigger than what it is sitting on that glass slide, right? So it's a ratio of what you see in the eyepiece to what's actually there in nature, okay? You can work out the magnification of this STM, right? You can bust out a ruler, and this is like the eyepiece and the STM, right? You can just measure how big the atom is on the page, yeah? You know how big the atom is in real life, get that ratio and you've got the magnification. Okay, so a couple of points. Show me the math, okay? Find out what's the magnification of this image. Okay, all right. Now, quick recap. Kind of a summary of what we've gone through. What's at the center of every atom? 
Nucleus. All right. What two types of particle are in the nucleus? Protons, which are plus, and neutrons, which have no charge, right? What quote-unquote orbits the nucleus? Later on we'll talk about how they don't really orbit, but uh, what are they? What are those things whizzing around the outside? They're electrons. Now, I'll tell you a quick story here, right? Maybe I'll throw up some slides if I can find them. This is actually, <laughs> if you look real close, that's me, right? So I was actually um, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge for a while, right? Okay, so that meant that uh, <laughs> you know, I was you know, working in the chemistry department at Cambridge and then uh, lunchtime comes around and it's time to go to the sandwich shop and here's me on my way to the sandwich shop, right? And I have to walk down what's called Tennis Court Road on the way to get my sandwich and you walk past these old looking buildings in Cambridge all the time and a couple of them have plaques on them, right? And hopefully I'll show the plaque in a kind of a separate picture. But um, it says in the plaque, let me just read it for you, okay. Here in 1897 at the old Cambridge Laboratory, J.J. J. J. Thompson discovered the electron, the first fundamental particle of physics, basis of chemical bonding, electronics and computing. So the electron is this kind of fantastic discovery. It was literally discovered six feet behind where I'm standing, right? And that's kind of cool if you're a nerd, yeah. So if you ever watched that documentary about Stephen Hawking and how he almost didn't become a theoretical physicist, they actually brought him in to um, the Cavendish right behind me there, and they actually showed him J.J. Thompson's uh, apparatus he used to discover the electron, and that kind of spurred him on to, to greatness, right? So it all happened six feet behind me there, okay? Now, as you can probably see from the picture, <laughs> if you zoom in, right? Oh, so I'll actually show you, it's kind of embarrassing, but uh, well, you've probably seen the picture I've added, right? This is what happens when you drink uh, lots of beer, right? So in England they have tasty beer and only four TV channels, so at night you don't stay in and watch TV. You go to the pub with your friends, drink beer and eat food, and you know, you get the freshman 15 back. And of course you've got to do some exercise. And in exercise in, in Cambridge is kind of interesting because they have punting. Hopefully they've got a picture for that. And I guess here's a picture of me on a punt, right? And taken by a friend of mine. And this is interesting because the first university in England was Oxford and they moved to Cambridge because they were getting mugged in the streets, right? And the great thing about Cambridge, Cambridge, it's on the River Cam, and you can actually build your college next to the river and then commute between colleges on a boat, and the boat's called a punt. So that's how they used to get around. Okay, so there's me actually, uh, old school on the River Cam. All right. Now, quick thing here. What I want you guys to do, and I'll flash up a picture, okay, so you can fill in the gap, so to speak, okay? What I want you to do is fill out a generic picture of an atom, okay? As you can see, and I'll find my one I printed earlier. So here's one I printed earlier, okay? Hopefully I've got it so you can see it, okay? Bottom line is, an atom is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters across, right, it's about 0.1 of a nanometer, while the nucleus is 10 to the minus 13 of a centimeter across, all right, so those numbers are actually somewhat meaningless, right? The question, the big question is, well, what's the difference in size? Well, there's 13 to 8, five orders of magnitude, right, so that's 100,000. The nucleus is a hundred thousand times smaller than the atom as a whole. The electrons are whizzing around here in mostly a region of empty space. All the mass pretty much is in the nucleus, okay, which is this tiny, tiny, tiny fraction, all right? So that is a fraction, 99 point, well, five, right? Nine, 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 the outside bit, I should say. So everything that's not the nucleus is 99.999% of the nucleus. The nucleus occupies that. So that's the nuclear volume. 0.001% of an atom is its nucleus. <laughs> Tiny, right? And that's why the gold foil experiment uh, done by Rutherford is so important, right? It's such a hard experiment to do. But back in the day he pulled it off. He showed the existence of this tiny nucleus. So make sure you read about that. 
Okay. Now, there's a couple of good analogies for the nucleus and, and the atom. So, if you take a marble that big and put it on the center spot of a soccer field or a football field, whatever you want, right? So, the marble compared to the width of the soccer field is the nucleus compared to the atom. Okay. Another good one is go to the go to Washington, right? Go to the Capitol Dome, that big old dome building, right? Take a P, hold it up in the center of the dome. The P compared to the dome is the nucleus compared to the atom. Careful when you do that though, because you may have some page run out and try and reclaim that congressman's brain. That's a joke. <laughs> right. Now, quick thing with the size, right? So Instead of talking about the mass of a proton or the mass of an electron or anything like that, which is 10 to the minus 34 kilograms or something crazy, right? We actually do a relative scale, right? So we take an electron as the, the kind of relative thing, right? We compare everything to the electron. So an electron has a symbol E, has a charge of minus one. It's actually 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, but that's not important right now. It just has a charge of minus one, minus one electron charge. And we say a mass of one, right? So an electron has a charge of minus one and a mass of one. Fair enough. Proton, symbol P, exactly the opposite size, one to one, but plus not minus, okay? So this is why they exactly cancel. If they're off by even by a tiny bit, they wouldn't cancel. So there you go. And then look at this mass here. It's 1,836 times heavier. So the nucleus contains protons which weigh 1,800 times more than electrons. Interesting. Okay. Neutron, no charge, weighs about the same. Okay, weighs about the same. All right. Now, I've got a very, very poor joke. <laughs> Neutron walks into a bar. Pint of beer, please, barman. Certainly, sir. How much will that be? To you, no charge. Okay, bad. <laughs> all right, now, the upshot of all this is that electrons, which are much lighter than the nucleus, right? So all this heavy stuff's in the nucleus. Electrons are much light, lighter, they move much quicker. So it turns out the lighter you are, the faster you move. Think about trying to swat a fly or a mosquito, right? You go like this, and they always fly off, don't they, right? Okay, that's because lighter things are much more fast moving, okay? And we call that the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, okay? So if I have my nucleus, the electrons are whizzing around super, super, super fast, like gnats around an elephant, right? You ever seen an elephant or some other you know, giant mammal on the African plain trying to get these flies off it? It's waving its tail and its ears around but never seems to hit a fly, right? Because to the fly, the tail and the ear are moving super, 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 super slow because they're heavy and big. To the elephant, the flies are super fast because they're tiny, right? Okay, so it looks like to an electron, which is moving super fast, it looks like the nucleus is kind of this frozen in time place, right? And they're just whizzing around it. To the nucleus, when it looks out, it just sees this cloud, right? It doesn't see sedately orbiting electrons. It seems this kind of blurred out cloud because they're moving so fast, okay? Now this, if you're into Star Trek like me, this has been the kind of, uh, science behind several episodes. So uh, in the wink of an eye, which is a classic 1960s Star Trek, the solutions actually get onto the Enterprise and they wreak all kinds of havoc because they are the electrons. They're super fast moving and the crew don't even see them moving around. Okay, they hear this kind of buzzing noise, but they don't know what's going on. Okay, and there's some classic scenes where, you know, all the, the crew are basically frozen like mannequins and you see the solutions walking around. It's classic sci-fi. All right, so that's kind of fun. So when we think about Electrons, we don't think about sedate orbits, because you can see the moon orbiting the Earth, right? No, no, we can't tell where the electrons are. They're blurred out like clouds, right? So we think of the cloud model, okay? All right. This is a good place to stop. In part two, we'll uh, get onto some details about how we kind of like deal with protons, neutrons, and electrons, and how it all relates to the periodic table, okay? All right, so we'll stop there. This will be uh, part one. I'll cobble the two videos together. And again, this is, you know, do this, you know, towards the end of week two, and uh, you'll be good. All right, stop there. See you next time.